Well, Liz, thank you so, so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to share your story. First, I just want to thank you. You are such a pioneer in co-working. I mean, you have set the stage for so, so many of us. So thank you for everything you've oh, done for co-working. Thank you, Felina. I remember you from 2012 at Juicy. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for creating such an amazing platform and excited that uh, we'll talk about a little later in the interview, you know, what you're focused on now with Juicy and all the amazing yeah. things you're doing. Cool. Uh, so, so first, uh, tell us just uh, the brief story, if you will, of how you decided to launch your co-working space and mm -hmm. just talk about some of the early years of that, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you, Felina. I mean, I'm inspired by you as well. You are groundbreaking and a pioneer in co-working as well. So, so right back at you. Thank um, you. So, you know, for me, my, my co-working business came about the way I think most businesses do. I was working from home and I was lonely. I was way too happy to see the UPS man. <laughs> I was checking my refrigerator every hour to see if anything had changed. And um, it hadn't, by the way. And um, it just, you know, I wanted a place to go work. So I tried Starbucks. And I had a really bad experience with an executive from Dell who was in from out of town. And I was like, this is so bad. And my, um, there was a kid screaming. My competitors were in the same space. There was no power. The coffee was overpriced and not that great. And I was like, this is awful. And then I went to a business center in Atlanta and I was like, oh, like I get this, but I don't like this place. And then I went to New York and I went to the W hotel lobby and I was like, Ooh, if we could take that business center and mash it with this hotel lobby and put in some meeting rooms and make the coffee free, this would be amazing. And so when I went and did the research, I found out that was called coworking. And so, um, you know, I knew that people's devices were becoming untethered and that smartphones were becoming more powerful and, you know, I was always looking for that thing at the base of the bell curve and co-working was at the base of the bell curve. They were actually flatlined far left at that point. And, um, yeah. So in 2010, I opened my co-working space in Austin, Texas, and the amount of events I threw and the amount of work I did in those first couple of years, I, I don't even know how I survived it. <laughs> I mean, I worked every day and I worked hard every day and I was constantly having to explain what co-working was like people didn't even know what it was back then but um you know eventually I I got to break even around 18 months and I um, started listening to my customers and they wanted dedicated desk space and they wanted offices so I quickly got about making my second location happen and um, that went well. And eventually I did a partnership with a real estate developer here in Austin and did um, one of the first management agreements and co working and added another, um, let's see here, about 20,000 square feet. Um, wow. So when I exited, I had three locations and I was the fourth largest operator in Austin. Amazing. Amazing. Talk a little bit about some of the advice along the way, uh, mm -hmm. lessons learned just in running a business in general. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. specific to co-working. Oh, sure. Um, I think the first thing is when you go and tell people what you're going to do, um, people are going to transfer their fear to you and they're going to tell you, you know, why it won't work. They're not going to believe in you. And even sometimes your family will tell you you shouldn't do something and like, don't listen to them. Just don't listen to them. Fear is a liar and you have to find the strength inside of you. It doesn't matter what all these other people think. This is your business and you're the one that's going to be working on it every day and thinking about it at night and never putting it down. So you better be able to defend it and work on it 24 seven. Um, I think the other thing that was like a really good learning is at one point um, I was sued and um, I fought it because I was right. 
And everybody told me not to. They said it's not worth the anxiety. It's not worth the um, money, but I wanted to fight it. And in retrospect, I should have listened to them. I should have just written a check and moved on. Because what it took from me mentally and what it took for me physically, it's not worth it. Yeah. Totally not worth it. I can imagine. So, so there are some fights you just don't need to fight. Yeah. You can be right and you still don't need to fight it. Um, so I think that was, that was some advice I wished I had taken. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing that I would say as somebody that runs you know, a large co-working conference is find your tribe mm -hmm. because I have so many people in this industry that I call on weekly for introductions, for information, for mentoring, for help. Um, and once you find your tribe, stay in touch with them and utilize them because every industry, there's other people doing what you're doing and you just need to, you know, find them and talk to them. And I think it's also, you know, thanks to me too and everything. I think that we're really focusing a lot more on women in business and I'm doing a lot more work with women in business. And, you know, I think we're approaching business in a different way and in an exciting way and a really uplifting way. And I have great, great hopes for the future. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that, Liz. Let's sure. talk about the inception of Juicy, uh, mm -hmm. the Global Coworking Unconference, for those of you who mm -hmm. don't know the acronym. Um, you, you were doing double duty, running mm -hmm. and launching and growing Juicy globally while mm -hmm. you were running your coworking spaces. Uh, mm -hmm. Just talk about that balance. And then I want to move into, you know, this point where, you know, was it, did someone approach you? Did you say, Hey, I, I can't split myself in two anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's yeah. get to the point of, you know, what, what came about for the transition? Yeah, absolutely. So Juicy um, actually grew out of an event that was here in Austin um, around South by Southwest. It was called the Coworking Unconference. It was a half day unconference. I didn't know what an unconference was for the, those of you that don't know, it's a day of crowdsource conference. So like on the first day of Juicy, I tell people what I think you need to hear. And on the second day, you tell me what you want to talk about. So it's awesome. So I went to this unconference and I met people from all over the world doing exactly what I was doing. And I knew this was my tribe and I was super excited about it. But I was sitting in the audience. There was a panel and I was looking at this panel and it was pretty much all white guys. And I was <laughs> like, you know. I don't see a woman really stepping up in this industry right now. And I was like, um, you know, the person that picks the people on stage is going to be powerful. And I want to pick the people on stage. So when the operators of the conference called me that summer and said, do you want to take this over? I was like, hell yeah, I want to take this over. And so I took it over and rebranded it. And um, I'm so glad I did. Um, because at that point, you know, I knew that this co-working thing was going to be global. So I named it, you know, the global co-working conference. And now Juicy is the largest co-working conference series in the world. We've done over 31 conferences all over the globe, including, you know, China, Australia, Canada, London, Brazil, and we do one annually every year in the U.S. So it, um, it's really great because it does give me the power to put people on stage and it gives me a reason to call anyone I want to in the world and ask them to be on stage, like Felina. <laughs> and so it is, uh, it's a really, it's a really cool, cool thing to do. It is, I did not think about the work before I did it. I just did it. Um, the very first Juicy, I completely put my co-working business on the line. I took a $30,000 yeah. bet. Mm. This was going to work. And thank God it did. But um, yeah, so basically a lot of it in the beginning was um, I used interns um, mm -hmm. and I worked a lot of weekends and a lot of nights because I yeah. could not get it all done. And I wasn't to the point where I was working on my business, my co-working business. I was still fully in it. Yeah. So I couldn't put that aside. So basically I had two full-time jobs. 
Yeah. And the juicy work could frequently be done on the weekends. So there was a lot of weekend work for about the first, I would say five years. Now we don't have to do that anymore, but we've got the systems figured out and, you know, we've kind of figured a lot of things out and figured out how to scale. But, um, you know, I never went to event class. I never <laughs> went to any of their industry events. So I am kind of a lone ranger after I told everyone to go find their tribe. I haven't found my event <laughs> tribe. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it was hard. I did not have good balance at that point. And, you know, I got really sick at one point, And I think part of it was because I was just working too hard. Absolutely. And so I had to learn that I had to put myself first and that I had to take care of my physical health. Um, so then what, what, what happened was with link is I was looking at link and I was like, okay, it is go big or get out time. So mm -hmm. either I'm going to scale this thing nationally or I should sell it. And at that point I looked at juicy and I was like, okay, how many competitors does juicy have? Not a lot. How many competitors does Link have? Tens of thousands. So I was like, I need to go focus on Juicy. And at that point, I felt like I had learned what I needed to learn from Link. I felt like it had um, run its course for me and that I didn't, I didn't want a bunch more locations. And so it was time for me to sell. Mm -hmm. And I did try to sell one time before that. I actually looked very hard at franchising. Mm -hmm. um, I was approached by fr some franchising companies. They actually ended up passing on me, which I was sad about. And then um, I looked at licensing and decided I didn't want to do that. And I was already licensing Juicy globally. So I didn't want more work in licensing. And so I was like, okay you know, what are you going to do? And at that point, Link was struggling just a little bit. So um, basically, I got a, a bottom feeder who came in and lowballed an offer, which totally discouraged me. And instead of wallowing that, I was like, you know what, there is only one person who can turn this around. And that is me. And I went after Link to turn it into the profitable business it needed to be because I was so distracted. Yeah. So I turned it around, got it rebuilt, got the numbers good back where they needed to be and started thinking about how I wanted to sell this business. And it was so interesting because what ended up happening was I was at a Lexi dinner and Lexi is like a network of spaces within coworking that I helped form the Lexi group. And I was at dinner at the Lexi, at the Lexi dinner. And on my way to the dinner, I was like, what about Nick Clark? What about Nick of Common Desk? So randomly, I end up sitting across from Nick Clark at dinner. And he's talking about how he's looking for a property in Austin. Well, at the time, I um, not only did I have Link, but I was working on another location in Austin. I was working on a downtown location. And so Nick and I started talking and I was like, you know what, if I could slide you into this downtown deal, um, I think Link would be super great for you. And we started talking and um, it kind of got stalled for a little bit. Um, and then because there was a third party involved and then all of a sudden it came together and it was right before Juicy, literally the worst possible timing in the world for me. Yeah. And we decided to do the deal and close it in two weeks. Wow. So I literally stuck Juicy on hold and worked on nothing but Link for two weeks to get everything over so that we could close the deal. And we did it because we had no choice. Wow. My goodness. <laughs> That's a lot of this. I know. It's <laughs> so, so interesting because I, you know, as I tell these stories, I've, I've now talked to, you know, a number of women and mm -hmm. everybody's got a different story, right? Mm -hmm. Some folks are, you know, somebody landed in my lap. Some folks, mm -hmm. I, I interviewed a woman the other day. She had 12 companies try to buy her 
before wow. she's in biotech, before she was, you know, willing to sell to the 13th suitor, right? Nice. You know, it, it's just, it's interesting. Most of the folks I've interviewed have not gone through business brokers. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. Is that yeah. something you ever thought about or? You know, I did talk to you. I've got a really good um, mentor at SCORE. And if you're mm-hmm. not familiar with SCORE, SCORE is, I know you are, but just for your Yeah, viewers, no, thank you. Um, I appreciate it. SCORE is uh, retired executives in conjunction with the SBA who give free mentoring. So you can get like, I've worked with the former CFO of Dell has looked at my numbers for me. Um, You know, so you can get these amazing executives and the woman who started business suites in Austin is my mentor. Mm -hmm. And um, she suggested a business broker. And I had like one conversation with them, but frankly, I was like, I'm not impressed. I mean, I kind of do the same thing with realtors I didn't really work with realtors and I don't really work with brokers because that's just taking away from my profit. Yeah, absolutely. Good. Awesome. So the process that two weeks, any advice or or lessons learned throughout that process? (laughs) You know, it really is, you know, you've got to keep your books in order all the time. You just have to. And then the other thing that I think was super helpful was years ago, we got a Google Doc that was the manual of how to run Link. And any time something came up, my question was always, is that in the operations doc? And so we constantly updated it so that when it came time to sell, we had the manual. Yeah. And the manual was done. So that was super helpful because literally every answer, every situation, everything was in there. Um, so I think, you know, keeping a um, real time operations document for your business is huge. And then, yeah, you just, you've got to have your books up to date all the time and ready to go. Um, and I think the other thing was, you know, Nick and I are friends. So, um, I think we didn't do as much due diligence as other deals would require. And because we decided to shorten the time frame so quickly, a lot of it was just like, I trust you. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's really just keep the books in order and and make sure you've got that manual. Awesome. Awesome. And what was that next day for you? Like the day that you didn't show up (laughs) at link, (laughs) you know what it was. So I had a delayed reaction because I'd put juicy on hold for two weeks and I had to pull juicy back. Like literally I did not even have a second to think about it. We just went straight after working at juicy on juicy. And then, you know, I think it was, so I closed on 221 and then Juicy's in April. So, I mean, it's Juicy is a sprint to the finish every year. It doesn't matter how prepared you are. Things come up, things pivot, people can't travel, whatever. Things happen. So I just went super heads down on Juicy. And then it wasn't until I got back from Juicy that I was like, where do I go? <laughs> Uh, what do I do? And, and I actually kind of got in a funk yeah. because I really missed my community. And I did make one big mistake. I was so busy. I did not take the time to do a proper goodbye party and celebration. Mm, yeah. And so there, my community needed that. I needed that. And I didn't do it. Mm. Now, am I going to do it now? Yes. And the funny thing is, and the cool thing is like, there's all these former link members that are so excited that we're going to have another party. Um, (laughs) So I think, you know, I think that was a mistake I made. You should celebrate it. I mean, I literally like tossed the keys, walked out the door and was gone. (laughs) Um, So I came back and I was kind of bummed. And so what I did was I joined a co-working community. (laughs) And it's a friend of mine. And so I go to her space and I got Stormy and I a desk and I latched into another community. And so then I was, then I was okay. Awesome. Awesome. But I do love not having to open the doors. Let me just say that. (laughs) I love it so much. Or the texts on Saturday morning or Tuesday night or the, (laughs) this doesn't work. Yeah, no, 
<laughs> yes, that running a space. Delightful. <laughs> it's a lot of work. I just want to say thank you for your time, Liz. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Thanks for sharing the yeah. the highs, the lows, the advice. Thanks so much. Have a perfect Great day. Ciao. Thanks. Ciao. Bye.